Welcome to Season 5 of Far Reach Voyages, where we share our love of sailing and adventure travel. At the end of Episode 4, I had arrived in the Virgin Islands after 12 days and 1,500 miles of some difficult sailing. I spent five days in Francis Bay, St. John, catching up on sleep and eating as much as I could. I topped off the water tanks in a series of rain showers. I washed the boat, inspected the rig, and cleaned and dried salty foul weather gear. I also finally ran out of ice. It hadn't lasted 15 days, which is pretty good, I'd say. One of the nice things about limiting convenient but unnecessary systems is your battery banks look like this every day, with just 90 watts of solar and no need to run the engine. There's nothing particularly exciting about this episode, but for me the value is in the easy pace and healing powers of unhurried life aboard a simple boat which doesn't invite hyperactivity and endless drama. Everything I do and every part of the Far Reach's modifications and layout are designed to emphasize sailing performance, seaworthiness, reliability, skill, mindfulness, and living in the moment. Offshore sailing on a simple boat gives me the risk and adventure I need, and which is a part of what makes me tick, while also challenging me to avoid unnecessary and unwanted drama. After five days of recovery, I slipped the National Park mooring in Francis Bay under sail and headed across Pillsbury Sound for St. Thomas. Underway. That's St. John. That's Francis, or Maho and Francis Bay, where we were. That's St. Thomas with all the houses on it underneath the boom. Just kind of taking it easy. Double reef main and working jib. Cut across Pillsbury Sound through Government Cut, past Christmas Cove, and then down the coast of St. Thomas. Sailing uh, west down the south coast of St. Thomas. Double uh, single reef main and working jib. Very light wind, sailing from Francis Bay across Pillsbury Sound. We sailed right through Government Cut. And now we're getting a little bit of breeze, but you can see the swell is still substantial out here from all the wind from the past week. Now it doesn't look like it now, but a couple of big rollers there a minute ago. It's Christmas Cove back there. That's a great place. And the infamous Epstein's Island back there. See St. John in the background under the clouds. And about, I don't know, eight miles to go. That's known as the Frenchman's hat, up there. I've been asked how I launch and recover the sweet pea. While I was a little rusty in this video, this is essentially how I do it. With two people, it only takes a couple minutes. I push the boom to one side and secure it in place. And then I use the painter, which is about 30 feet long, secured to the bow eye, the dinghy, and I run it through a bronze pad eye I threw bolted into the transom, making a lifting bridle. I secure that line with a bowline, which I position so I can untie it from the deck of the far reach after the dinghy is in the water. I find the center of the bridle, and I secure the main halyard to it with a single sheet bend knot. If it's windy, I tie a second line to the bow of the dinghy secured forward on the far reach so the sweet pea remains head to wind when she hits the water. I've launched and recovered the dinghy under some pretty wild conditions without too much difficulty. Winds at 20, 
may be gusting to 25. Anyway, I take up on the main halyard enough to hoist the dinghy off its chocks. Once I maneuver it over to the lifelines, I flip it 180 degrees. Through practice, I've learned how high I need to hoist it, so it'll clear the lifelines. Keep in mind, my lifelines are 30 inches above the deck, vice the standard 24 inches. Since I took this video, I installed another set of pad eyes into the boat, so I can tie the oars into the dinghy in such a way they remain in place through the launch and recovery process. Also, when the dinghy is stored on deck, I mount the dagger board and rudder bolted together between the thwarts like a shelf, with the mainsail in its bag sitting on top of it, secured to the boat. So everything is self-contained. The oars, dagger board and rudder, and the sail are always stored inside the dinghy when I'm sailing offshore. Since the sweet pea serves as my lifeboat, I can launch the whole thing at one time as a single unit. The mast and boom for the sailing rig are stowed alongside the far reaches aft lowers. You can see them in the photos if you look carefully. It's quick and easy to drop them right into the dinghy from the deck. The dinghy in the water, I untied the bowline and pulled the painter out of the tramps and pad eye. Recovery is done in the same way, but in reverse. Here I am lowering the sweet pea with one hand on the halyard with a couple of wraps on the halyard winch and the other hand steadying the sweet pea. I tie a throw cushion to the bullet to protect the paint. You'll see me remove it shortly. Then when the gunnel is clear of the bullet, I let the dinghy drop into the water. For two people, the whole process is a snap. Right there is the bowl and tied in the bridle. I'm untying it now and you can see how I can untie it from the deck. What you want to do is eliminate having to crawl in and out of the dinghy several times to complete the launching process. Here I am making some repairs to the teak grate that fits in the sweet pea. Along with fiberglass, epoxy, varnish and paint, I carry gobs of tools, including my entire woodworking kit. Hand plane, spoke shave, files, draw knife, sharpening stones, hand crank drills, and a vise. Folks new to voyaging don't always think about all the stuff you need to stow if you plan to be self-sufficient. That's why I built so much storage into the boat. When I built the interior, I also found the space for a very handy workbench which I was able to make larger several years later when I decided to install an inboard engine. Not long after I picked up the Mori in St. Thomas, a friend on a nearby boat asked if I would check on his mooring chain. I'd inspected this same chain two years before and it was in good shape then. Look at that wasting. You wouldn't believe the things I found on moorings. No seizing wire, shackle pins about to fall out, links corroded almost entirely through, just like these. Hanging your boat on a mooring, public or private, you haven't personally inspected, is to put your boat at peril. I always carry mask, fins, weight belt, wetsuit, and a wide assortment of shackles and swivels along with seizing wire. Like I learned in the Marines, you get what you inspect, not what you expect. I had a quiet Christmas, but my friend Ed Bufkin, a professional baker and chef, showed up unannounced on Christmas morning with a full meal of lamb chops and German stolen bread as a gift for working on his mooring. There's a lot of camaraderie in the sailing community, especially among voyaging boats. I'm sometimes asked what I do all the time. Well, I stay plenty busy. I myself am not much of a cook, but I've worked hard over the years to improve my bread making. 
On Gail's board, we sometimes have contests to see who can make the best bread. She usually wins. Here I made a bega for a loaf of bread that turned out pretty good. I also learned how to make homemade jam with a simple foolproof recipe that even a marine can make. Look at the consistency of that jam. In late December, I sailed back to St. John for five days with a Marine buddy that flew in from New England on its way to Patagonia. But then, in the middle of January, I returned once again to St. John, where I took a couple of weeks for a very leisurely single-handed circumnavigation. The Drake Channel, Virgin Gorda, Peter Island, Norman Island, and St. John. And we're going to attack right back through there. back to the Narrows, from which we came. I'm in Round Bay, about 18 feet of water. Look at that water. It's ridiculous. the anchor. It's a tough job. Somebody has to do it. Let's see if we get visitors. I rigged Sweet Pea for sailing while I was in Round Bay. She's a nine foot fatty knees and has been a terrific dinghy. I've had her for almost 20 years. I'd never trade her for an inflatable. These are some pictures a friend took in 2019. She'll still be working hard when the best inflatable is hanging on by a thread or long since been cast off to the landfill or wherever inflatables go when they die. If I'm not sailing to a new destination, I usually spend the morning enjoying coffee in the cockpit and then clean and inspect the boat. I'll take care of any preventive maintenance on my list. After lunch, I make a conscious effort to swim every day. I usually roll around the anchorage just before dusk, often stopping to chat with other sailors and checking out interesting boats. But make no mistake, I can spend a lot of time just goofing off in the water. As a Navy and Marine Corps trained scuba and closed circuit diver, I have a pretty good grasp of diving physiology. Though I carry a DIY hookah for cleaning the bottom of the boat, I ventured into free diving a few years ago. Though I haven't attended a specific free diving course, I have read and carefully studied both Ada 1 and Ada 2. Since I spend so much time single-handed, by necessity I mostly swim alone. I'm therefore very conservative and cautious with breath holds. 
But the increased freedom I've discovered through free diving and the underwater world it has opened up to me has been really enjoyable. While there's no denying the shallow water reefs are in pretty bad shape, there's still a lot of beautiful marine life to see. I never get tired of free diving and always enjoy the challenge of identifying and writing down the names of all the many different kinds of coral and fish I see. In the next episode, I'll sail back to St. Thomas from St. John. This will be an extended video with minimal narration. If you think you might enjoy the lovely sights and soothing sounds of sailing on the far reach without hype or drama, then come join me as I work down the coast and then pick up our mooring single-handed under sail in Elephant Bay. If you enjoyed this episode of Far Reach Voyages, let us know in the comments. Also, consider liking and subscribing as it tells us you'd like to see more videos and it helps the channel grow. See you in the next episode.